So hello and welcome to all our Amherst community members to our chat for Thursday, April 30th. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Brianna. I'm the communications manager for the town. We'll be holding short live chats like this on Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon for the next couple of weeks. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, so please refrain from asking any personally identifying health questions. In this webinar, to ask us a question from the Zoom application, click the Q&A button and type your question into the box. Um, if you'd like to speak, please use the Zoom raise hand button or press star nine if you're joining us from the telephone. We ask that you introduce yourself before speaking and to maintain a civil discourse. So today we have Town Manager Paul Bachelman and Health Director Julie Fetterman. Welcome to you both. Hi. Happy Thursday. Yes, it's rainy Thursday. Yes, not as nice as Tuesday where we had some sunshine. Mm -hmm. Um, so before we go into Q and A's, I wonder if there's any updates from you, Paul, in terms of um, town happenings. Sure. Um, thanks, Brianna, and thanks for organizing this again. So uh, on this week, uh, Governor Baker extended the his orders for stay at home and essential services uh, from May 4th to May 18th, and uh, the town uh, has extended the same orders and just coincide with the state. So. We're, the next sort of target date is May 18th, and that's the earliest possible time we would see any kind of um, uh, relief on, on the stay at home order or um, the uh, requirement that only essential services be delivered. Um, so they, as we anticipated, we talked about previously, they are looking at this in sort of small chunks of time and seeing how things work. They want to see that the curve is starting to flatten and then go down a certain number of days of reduced hospital admissions, I think is the real benchmark that they're using. Um, as, and, and they're not seeing it go down at this point, it's kind of flattened, it's plateaued and it's sort of staying there. So they, that's why I think the governor felt it was important to extend it. Um, so that's, that's the only thing, I'm not sure if Julie, you wanna add anything at the beginning? Sure, good afternoon. I have a, a couple of items I wanna address. Um, first of all, some of you are readers of the Hampshire Gazette and, and uh, readers of our town website and the Department of Public Health website. Um, and if so, you may have noticed that yesterday and today, there's a reporting of 83 cases of COVID-19 for the town of Amherst. Um, in reality, yesterday, the number of cases was 33, and today, the number of cases is 35. This um, error that has appeared is an, uh, an accounting error that has happened at the Department of Public Health level. Um, because testing is done in many places through many different labs, there was an entity whose test results went through inaccurately and generated one address in Amherst for many, many people who do not live in our community and are actually nowhere near our community. So the Department of Public Health is working to go through each one of those cases and determine where they actually do live and assign them to those towns. Meanwhile, this incorrect number is um, out there electronically. Um, so we wanted to reassure folks that we have not seen a giant jump in numbers in the town of Amherst. So today we have 35 cases in Amherst and that number shall, you'll be seeing that, that 83 number go down and that will be accurate. It will go back to um, what it should be. Now in the course of today, um, we may get a couple more cases. So you should be, you will be seeing over the next few days and the next week or so that we have a few more cases likely each day. Um, part of this is because what we're seeing in Massachusetts is that the number went up steeply in Eastern Mass. And now um, we're sort of seeing Western Mass begin to follow that pattern. So we won't be surprised to see an increase in cases. Um, so just wanted to, to clarify that for everyone. Do you know, uh, Julie, if the website, the state website will be fixed or what, do they just do that once a week, like every Wednesday they update it? Will they do it in between now or will they just wait till next Wednesday? No, they're working really hard on it. They tried to get it accomplished um, for this, for our town by um, 
four o'clock yesterday and they weren't able to. So they're continuing to work on it all day today. Okay. We're hoping that they'll be able to correct it by the end of the day. Okay. Um, again, they have so much data that they're working with at the state level that we can't be sure, but no, they won't wait until next Wednesday. They'll get it corrected earlier than that. But that's okay. a good question. Um, the other topic uh, we wanted to update people about was we were able through a collaboration with um, Cooley Dickinson Hospital Lab, Healthcare Services for the Homeless, and Craig's Doors to test our Craig's Doors community. And we're happy to report the that the result of that is that no one needed quarantine or isolation, which is terrific news. Craig's Doors has done an incredibly good job of screening folks who come into the shelter every night, providing them with masks, cleaning surfaces, educating people about how to keep themselves safe and um, creating social distance within the shelter. Um, so we're really pleased about that and um, happy that Hampshire College was there ready to welcome people if we did need quarantine. So we feel um, very pleased about this. I just want to mention that I uh, really a credit to our team, you know, uh, DPW and uh, Superintendent Guilford Mooring and Assistant Town Manager um, Dave Zomack and our Police Chief Scott Livingstone. Everybody was on, and Fire Chief, of course, Tim Nelson were were working hard to prepare Hampshire College. Again, you know, shout out to Hampshire for opening the doors, and then our team for getting those doors ready. We had it all set up, and thankfully, it's not going to be required. Um, and so we've informed Hampshire College of that, and they are very, it is interesting, their, his, the president's first response was so good for those people, um, and it was a, a really nice response, initial response. Um, so uh, so we are, so that's a really good news story for, for our town. And I also think, uh, just to echo something Julie said about thanking, you know, recognizing the efforts of Craig's Doors and the staff for being proactive early on on ident you know, educating people, identifying folks, reorganizing the shelter so people were at the best they could be socially distanced uh, at night. So they do important work and so thank them for all their work at, all year round. Great, all right, thank you for those updates. Mm -hmm. So we have a question that just came in from um, Sarah here and she, this is probably for Paul. Will the special town council meeting on May 11th include any update or discussion of the major capital projects? Mm, thanks, Sarah. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, so on May 11th, we will be uh, the interim finance director, Sonia Aldridge, and I will be presenting to the um, town council, to the school committee, and to the board of library trustees with uh, economic information on where we think the town is in terms of revenues uh, going for the rest of fiscal 20 and looking into FY21. People may know or uh, that the town council has adjusted the budget deadlines. They've said we want to see a one, uh, one month budget um, for the month of July and then given us additional time to create a budget for the rest of the fiscal year. And I think that's a, a reasoned approach to looking at this. Um, our our we don't have much new information about the capital projects. We have been in touch with the Board of Library Commissioners and the Mass School Building Authority. They are still actively moving on all these projects. So, um, but it, we will probably identify them, but not have any new information to share uh, come May 11th. Great, thank you. We've got another question here um, asking, what are the plans for Amherst restaurants and businesses reopening? <laughs> so Julie and I look at each other. Um, so the restaurants uh, are open um, so in the sense that they're doing curbside pickup. We have also, um, some restaurants are um, also offering additional things uh, like uh, offering groceries. You can buy groceries at certain restaurants. They're, they're able to uh, offer that. The inspections department has uh, helped them to facilitate that. Um, you know, I know that like Amherst Coffee, you can go get a whole meal from them and take it home. And, you know, they're able, restaurants are able to offer uh, bottles of wine and things like that. So it's, it's, there are, they've been really creative in how they've responded. 
um, to it. And and I think this is going to be the new normal for a while. I think restaurants are, are very social. Um, and that, that will be one of the, they're, they're going to be operating in a reduced capacity for quite some time. And we're talking months, um, not just a matter of weeks. Um, but in, in that time, we'll be working with them to figure out new ways that they can uh, be delivering their goods, their their meals in ways that are that are meeting the the uh, social protocols that we that are going to be instituted because COVID nineteen is going to be with us for quite some time. So um, you know, they we're open to all kinds of creative ideas, and the business improvement district and the chamber have been scouring um, the the country to look at models that we can uh, follow here. Julie, anything you want to add to that? I'll just add to that when we were approached with the idea that restaurants could sell groceries, uh, it felt like such a great idea because many of our restaurants are quite well prepared to have the cold storage that's necessary for groceries and then the dry storage. And what we learned is that restaurants often have different suppliers than mm -hmm. your grocery stores. So this will kind of maximize the places where people can get food and um, the availability of food because we're all seeing at different times, whether it's eggs or, or toilet paper, not a food, but still a dry good, um, that they're in short supply. And so this will um, help to open up more supply streams to come into town and make it um, easier for folks to be able to get what they need and then also give restaurants um, a revenue stream while we go through this period of time when we're trying to figure out as a state how these very social entities can, can open in a way that's safe. Um, we're really hoping that this will help to provide them with a revenue stream. And what's interesting is outside my office, you can see um, Lime Red, the bubble tea shop. And when the weather warms up, they have a little counter outside or that they put the drink, you order in advance, they put the drinks on the counter and then you come up and you pick them up with your name on it and they're monitoring that. So you see more and more people um, stopping by to get their bubble tea. They don't enter the store, they don't have to enter the store. And uh, so I think there'll be more creative ways for businesses to meet the needs of the customers and uh, allowing people to safely travel into town and be able to get those things and a note that there is no uh, charge for parking and there's no enforcement of parking unless you park in a handicapped or loading zone or something like that. Great. Now, the next question we have has been asked and answered a few times. So um, I'll ask it again just because it does keep coming up. Uh, why are we not requiring masks at this time? Thank you for the question. That is definitely something that people are continuing to ask about, to talk about. So I'm going to sort of address the whole mask issue broadly and they get more specific. So there are basically three different types of things we're calling masks. So there's N95s. Those are the ones you've heard about that are rather expensive and short supply. Um, and those are specifically for healthcare workers. And even within the healthcare setting, there's such a shortage of them that they're being um, really targeted towards certain types of procedures where the healthcare staff really need that kind of protection. The next type of mask is called a simple mask or a surgical mask. That's a, you know, you've often see them, they're often blue, sometimes they're light yellow, they're made of paper, they open up and they slip over the ears. Um, sometimes they're called a procedure mask. So these types of masks, again, are prioritized for those who are working in some type of healthcare or high risk setting. Um, it's also hard for hospitals, long term care facilities and other entities to get those types of masks. So they're really prioritized for those entities. Um, and that leaves us with the cloth face covering, which is sometimes being referred to as a mask also. So um, what that refers to is anything that made of cloth that someone can put over their mouth and nose, um, a bandana, a tightly knit, tight, tightly knit um, cotton scarf, as opposed to wool or any type of yarn. The reason I'm emphasizing that is anything that's stretchy like wool or yarn that's been knitted together um, 
really is too porous to give any type of protection to anyone. So what you're seeing a lot of people wear are homemade masks, which um, first of all should be made out of a very tightly woven um, cotton and or layered with a tight flannel. Both of those types of fabrics have been found to be the least porous. There's also some recent research out of, I believe it's the University of Chicago, that shows if you layer two different types of fabric, like the tightly woven cotton and the tight flannel, that you're also creating a type of electro stat static staticity, static between the two fabrics. And so that not only are you getting two layers of protection that can trap possibly microbes, there's also some static action that's happening between the two layers of fabric that may also contribute to trapping the tiny microns of virus. That being said, there is really no data yet to support the effectiveness of this type of face covering. So that is why we are not requiring them in the town of Amherst. If people want to wear this type of covering when they can't or they may not be able to social distance but, um, six feet or more, then it's possible that this type of face covering may provide a little bit of protection. But what we really want to emphasize in Amherst is the importance of that six feet of social distancing. We're still asking that you stay home, that you only go out if necessary to places where you may come in contact with other people. And when you do, to be six feet apart. Now that doesn't mean that you can't go outside. This really is referencing going to um, a place that might be crowded like a park or going into a store. If you wanna be outside and exercise, absolutely. There's no reason to not be outside breathing the fresh air as long as folks are six feet apart. Great, thank you for addressing that again, Julie. Appreciate I that. Do, uh, yeah, but I, I think it's as, as interesting because you had some new information I hadn't heard before about the electrostatic um, information and um, but I think that that speaks to how you continue to re, uh, scour the research and educate yourself and, edu and talk to your colleagues in public health about what is the best practice. So if there is evidence, again, we've been trying to align all of our policies along with the best scientific evidence, along with the State Department of Public Health and the Centers for De Disease Control. And so as we align those things and keep our best practices following those, those um, principles, I think we'll be, we're in the best shape. So, but it doesn't, it means that we're always thinking about this and reviewing it and on a daily basis saying, well, we may change this or any of our decisions going forward based on new, new evidence. So just to put that caveat in there today, this is, and this is, we said this early on when we started meeting, like um, we'd make a decision and then make a different decision the next day. And it was like, you know, we made this decision yesterday and we made it differently today, it doesn't mean that yesterday's decision was wrong. It was like, it was based on the best information we had and the decision we make today might be different based on the new information we have. So uh, I think people should, you know, it's, a, it's an evolving situation and, um, you know, the, we, we continue to scour and look around for new evidence that might support a different position if that's what's required. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take a quick chance to remind our uh, attendees who are on the call live, use Q&A button to put your question to us or raise your hand in the Zoom application um, to ask your question live. So the next question we have, um, I think a lot of people are think projecting to the warmer weather. Mm. Uh, will pools be allowed to open as the weather gets warmer? And what will that look like? Thank you for the question. Um, I think one of the things that's very interesting about the about swimming pools is that they are chlorinated. And so I think a lot of folks are asking about, um, well, we know that chlorine um, affects the virus, neutralizes the virus. Um, I think, unfortunately, the real issue around pools is the fact that it will mean lots of people will gather together. So again, we're looking at the social distancing. What would it mean to gather people around a public swimming pool? So the state is getting many questions about this also. And so we're, we're 
following the state's lead. And at this time, um, there isn't a plan for swimming pools opening. Um, and when there is, we will be right on top of that information because we know while it's cool and rainy today, that, that wonderful warm weather is right around the corner. Um, in the town of Amherst, our pools don't usually open until the end of June. So, um, and I guess in New England in general, it certainly takes a while to heat up. So, but this is a, um, a topic that's being closely watched because we know how important it is to people. Great, thank you. And kind of along that same vein, um, another question is, can we use Puffer's Pond? Are we going to be able to swim there again or at least use the beach? Well, I'll talk about the beach part. So we have closed the beach to people for uh, static or stationary sitting and things like that. Uh, it's fine to walk through Puffer's Pond. We want to keep that open. We want to encourage people to exercise. Uh, it's okay for solitary fishing, things like that. But we don't want it to become a gathering place. And we'll be monitoring that uh, with police officers on a regular basis to make sure that we don't start, we don't see groups starting to gather there. Um, it's still cold, but it's, we all know that as soon as that first, you know, 75, 80 degree day pops, that Puffers becomes um, a very attractive place for people to attend from all over the region, not just Amherst, obviously. Um, we have not restricted parking there at this point in time. Um, we, again, that's one of those things that we will continue to monitor and review and, um, and, and see how we can best achieve the uh, public health benefits of keeping crowds, keeping people from gathering together, especially people who don't aren't used to seeing each other. Family households are one thing, but it's people gathering from multiple family households uh, uh, together. Um, but in terms of swimming, Julie, I mean, usually Puffers isn't ready to swim. Well, there's some hardy souls that get out there early, though, aren't there? There are, yes. And um, so I think Paul um, explained that well. It's, it's tight quarters at Puffers. So if you've got people gathering there, they're going to be too close together. Um, I think it's also worth putting out there that at this time of year, even when it's really hot, the water is very cold. And it's really never a good idea to go boating too early or to swim too early because um, Frankly, your risk of drowning in cold weather, cold water is much higher than when the water warms up. So we wouldn't want to see people swimming yet anyway. Um, and uh, because of just the way puffers is set up, it's, it, people are just going to be too close together. So I think we'll be a ways from allowing people to be able to swim at puffers. Great. Thank you. Uh, one of the last questions I have here is, um, how do both of you see us coming out of this? What's the next phase? It's a, nobody knows for sure. Nobody has a crystal ball. But I do think that uh, we are all looking at ways that we can move um, our, our, ex, uh, our exit strategy in a sense. I think that what we will recognize is that um, this is a new reality that we will have. We don't know if the university and colleges will be open or if they are open, what they will look like uh, coming forward after in September. Um, they will, it will come in phases. I think that hopefully the, the state will, you know, as they talk about turning the dial, open things up a little bit. Uh, you don't want to open up too much and then have to retract and, and retrench uh, things that you had previously achieved. So we want to do it in a step by step and with the, with the um, it's kind of been amazing to me to see how creative people are, especially the business community, because they've, they've been hard hit. And, you know, teachers who are teaching at home or, or teaching students remotely, um, students who have been figuring out ways to, new ways to learn and new ways to explore the world. Um, I think there's lots of new things happening, and those might become part of the norm going forward. So, but I think in, for, in terms of Town of Amherst, we're really heavily dependent on restaurants and um, and, and you know bars and and things like that things that are by definition social and I think you're going to see that uh, in a really um, open up very slowly uh, the town is working with the business community to say is there a way we can have people sit outside properly socially social distance so there can be more of a sense of community can we um, 
grab back more some of the street to create more areas that we can have for dining or um, but again all these things it all depends on being properly distanced from other people um, and and because there's so still so much that we don't know about the disease and how it spreads we know a lot but we don't know everything we, we want to be conservative in how we approach it because we We've done really well in Amherst, and I think Julie has said this before that we really want to thank everybody for how well they have done. But we want don't want to lose our path. We want to stay on this really good path that we're on. And Julie, you want to talk about how this is? Infected? Yeah, I I think you explained that really well, and I think one of the things that I'm really excited about is the fact that several states are working together mm -hmm. because. Um, in New England, you know, all these small states were also close together. New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, even New York are all, Rhode Island are very close to us. So the fact that we're all working together on how to open means um, that, let alone all the towns around us, all working together, all following the same sort of gradual opening up, I think will really pave the way for um, keeping ahead of this virus. And it's just this delicate balance between trying to bring our economy back, trying to get folks back to work, um, get our kids back to what they're usually doing. And at the same time, making sure that we don't slip back in some way as we control the spread of the virus. So it's really a delicate balance there. And I'm, I'm so happy about the way folks are working together in Massachusetts and then in the surrounding states. I think it's really a recipe for things moving forward in a safe and effective way. So I was on a call um, earlier this week with other mayors and managers. And one of the things that we talked about was sort of about sectors and, you know, like um, restaurant sectors and things like that, but also geographical regions that what might be happening in Eastern Massachusetts might be slightly different than Western Massachusetts or on Cape Cod. And then there might be some variation. So you might re read something is happening in this section of, of the state. It's not happening here or vice versa. So, um, you know, so I think that there will be some variation, um, but it has to be thoughtful, it has to be based on your, the best assessment of our communities. And that's why I think the governor's office has been doing a more aggressive job of reaching out to municipal officials to say, how would this work in your town? How would it work in someone else's town? Uh, the only other thing I want to add, Biron, I know we're at the end of our time, is that the um, our inspections department and health director have been working with the farmer's market as well in the hope of getting the farmer's market open and uh, um, reviewed by the town council. Uh, we anticipate that they will be there um, to the town council on May 18th um, for, for that for the review of their plans. Hopefully that will all come together. Uh, so they're anxious to get started. They're looking at an, a virtual farmer's market where you can pick up, you can order groceries in advance, uh, pick them up on farmer's market on a totally touchless um, uh, system. Uh, and it'll, the farmer's market will look different. It will not be a social setting. Uh, it will be about getting groceries in an outdoor setting um, properly distanced and things. So the farmer's market folks have been really good at saying, how can we make this happen? And they've been working really well together with our inspection services to lay out a plan that's going to look different, but be really robust, I think. Oh, that's great. Um, before, I, before I wrap, I, I just want to say, um, Steve sent us a message saying, thanks, Julie, Brianna, and Paul. Very useful and interesting. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for joining us and everybody who's on the call. Um, I just want to say that next Tuesday, May 5th at noon, we're going to be chatting with Assistant Town Manager and Conservation and Development Director David Zomak. So please tune in. Same link, same phone number. All of our recordings are posted to our YouTube channel on our playlist. Um, and we have one last comment coming in from Library Director Sharon Sherry. We think you rock too. Thanks for tuning <laughs> yes. in. Um, stay safe, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.